Hallelujah. Could you stand to your feet with us? What amazing day. What an amazing day to lift up our King. Thank you, Jesus.
watches over us with a tender love that knows no bounds. With divine grace and infinite mercy, he leads the wayward sheep back to safety. Only the good shepherd leaves the 99 in search of the one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. No matter how lost or how far astray we've gone, 
He always extends a hand of forgiveness and redemption, guiding us back to his loving embrace, his grace unending, his love unconditional. Amazing grace. Could you extend your hands all over the room, Zion? Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you, Lord. Sing this with me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve I pray just it that grace appear Sharabasorio I first believe my chains are gone, have been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace.
free. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed, church. Is free indeed. Is free indeed. Who are we? We're a free people. We're a free people. We're a free people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God. My God. My God. My God. Oh, we thank you, God. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. My God, 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 my God. Father, we thank you for stepping into human history, for stepping into human history, for putting on skin and bone and flesh and coming like us and paying the price and the cost on the cross, dying a criminal's death on our behalf taking upon himself our sin, our judgment. We thank you for the grace. We thank you for the grace. For it is your grace that makes this Friday a good Friday. It is your grace that makes today a good Friday. So one more time, would you give God a shout of praise? Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Praise God. Hey, listen, I know we got a full house before you're seated. Would you just greet somebody around you? Praise God. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to be in God's house. I want to welcome those of you in the room, those of you watching online. I'm Pastor Moses, one of the pastors here, just privileged and honored to be a part of this incredible community we call All People's Church. And uh, we're just so thankful and grateful for what God is doing. Come on, somebody. And uh, today's a good Friday. Good Friday. <laughs> um, especially if you've received his grace. Amen. Amen. Uh, the cross is this incredible demonstration that our God has the power and the ability to take what is brutal, to take what is hideous, and to bring life out of it. That's what we see in the cross. That God can take what the enemy meant for evil and he can turn it for good. He can turn it for good. For they thought that the crucifixion meant the end. They thought the crucifixion meant Jesus was defeated. What they didn't understand is that they were helping Jesus fulfill his assignment. <laughs> they were helping Jesus Accomplish the purpose for which he was sent. And because Jesus has accomplished the purpose for which he was sent, you and I are here some 2,000 years later celebrating and rejoicing in the fact that what was dead within us has been brought to life. 
What an incredible God. What an incredible God we have. I wanna welcome you to our Easter weekend. Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday's coming up. It's just around the corner, amen? amen. We've been in this series titled Yeshua HaMashiach, and we've been focusing on this idea of the lost and the found. And I love that we sang Amazing Grace, because how many know we were lost, but we have been found. And that even within our lostness, there was a season where God was hidden. So not only has God found us, we have found God. We have found God. God has given us the ability to have spiritual eyes. God has awakened us spiritually, brought us back to life. And so we've been found, but we've also found God. Amen. I want to read to you a scripture out of John, and then I want to go into a parable found in Luke 15. This morning we're doing things a little bit different. I'm actually going to break my message up into two portions, and so I'm going to give you the first portion now, and we're going to have some worship. There's going to be an opportunity in a moment to give, and then I'll come back up to give the second part of my message, and then we will have communion at the end. Pastor Tony will come up to lead us in that. How does that sound? I think there's no other verse in all of the Bible that demonstrates what tonight was like or this morning was like. John 19 verse 30 says this, and when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He said, it is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. I wanna talk to you this morning about what true love looks like. Because I think if there's anything that the cross demonstrates, it's this, how much the Father loves you. I think the, I think the cross truly demonstrates how much God loves you. And so in order to help me do that, I wanna turn our attention to Luke 15. I'm gonna invite you to stand. We're gonna read out of this parable in Luke 15 this morning. The Bible says this, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. In that day and age, to eat with somebody was equivalent with accepting somebody, accepting who they are, accepting their lifestyle. And so they say, this man not only receives them, he eats with them also. Verse three, so Jesus told them this parable. He says, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Notice, until he finds it. How long will God pursue those who are lost until he finds them? Verse five, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. So not only does God love you, I want you to know God rejoices over you. God rejoices over you. One of the prophets in the Old Testament tells us he sings and dances over us. Verse six, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, hey, you rejoice with me also, for I have found my sheep that was lost. The meaning of this parable is explained in verse seven. He says this, just so, just like this, I tell you, uh, there will be more joy. Someone say more joy. In heaven over one sinner. One sinner. Over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So who is God rejoicing over? Those who have repented. God literally changes the environment of heaven because you come home. How good is that? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for these next couple of moments. I pray that you would bless us and grace us with the ability to hear you plainly and clearly. May we see you, Jesus, lifted high. 
Holy Spirit, speak to us collectively as a house, as a body, but also individually, for you know the place we need you the most. I know that you can do both things at once. And so we do that, and we invite you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So what we'll do in the next seven minutes that I have in this segment, I'm gonna talk to you about this parable and then we're gonna worship some more. And when I come back, I'm gonna talk to you about how this parable and the story of Good Friday helps us see what true love is. Here's the thing about about our generation, about our culture. Um, Hey, they just keep redefining terms. You know what I mean? And it's like, how can you really know if something is true if it's been redefined 10 times? Hello? Even in your life, I'm sure you've redefined what it means to be successful multiple times in your life. What you thought meant success as a child probably changed as you grew up into adolescent years, and that probably changed as you grew up and got married, and that probably changed as you became a grandparent. Like, those, those terms really mean the different things in different seasons, and I would like us to just, for a moment, allow this narrative, allow this text, allow the story of Good Friday to help shape what true love is. True love is found in Jesus. How, how do I know that? Well, the Bible says that The righteous and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of that day are upset because sinners are being attracted to Jesus. Could you imagine? They're upset that they are being attracted to Jesus. And just to give you the context, they weren't allowed to actually even have a rabbi because of their questionable character and lifestyle. And yet Jesus allows them to come close to him. Not only does he allow them to come close to him, he actually receives them and he eats with them. Now, I want you to understand this. This was no easy task for the sinners and the tax collectors and those with poor reputations to actually go to Jesus because there was something within culture that actually prohibited these individuals to experience such a thing. They would have had to overcome internal hurdles, not only internal hurdles, they would have had to overcome the opinions of other people. How dare you think you can get that close to what is holy? How dare you think you can get that close to what is sacred and what is spiritual? And so at some point, they would have had to get over themselves and over the opinions of people so that they can find their way to Jesus. And maybe there's some of you here that Jesus is actually drawing you and what is keeping you back is internal conflict and the opinions of other people. But let me tell you, if those things always hold you back, you will never find your way to Jesus. See, the true secret sauce to your relationship with God is this, desperation. Desperation is the secret sauce to your relationship with God. What is desperation? Let me say it this way. We all have needs and we all have wants. Hello? Sometimes our wants drive us and other times our needs drive us. If we're all honest and if you're like me, maybe your wants drive you more than your needs. You know what I mean? You ever gone shopping? You, you're like, I, I want this, but I don't need this. You know what I mean? And you have this internal conflict of, yeah, but it, it looks so good, you know? And if I'm honest, most often when I go shopping, my wants, they tend to win. Yeah. <laughs> But there comes a moment in your life when it comes to particular decisions, when it comes to a shift in the trajectory of your life, there has to come a moment where your want actually gets subjected to your need. There has to come a moment where your need becomes so strong that you're willing to put aside your wants and your preferences. That is the moment of desperation. That is the moment of desperation. It's the moment where you begin to want what you need. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, it's the moment. Yeah, come on, we can praise God. It's the moment where you actually choose to want what you need. And that's what these individuals do. So Jesus invites them into that. Now, 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 what the parable actually exposes is something actually far more scandalous than Jesus receiving sinners. You know what that is? Not only does Jesus receive sinners, he pursues them. So he tells the parable. 
Hey, there's a shepherd, he's got a hundred sheep, and one of the hundred sheep begins to wander off. He's left with the 99. The one who is lost is symbolic for the sinners that the Pharisees and the religious leaders are upset about. So in other words, here's what Jesus is saying. There are 99 people who think they're close to God and one who isn't. So not only do I welcome the one, not only do I receive the one, I actually pursue the one. I pursue the one. That is far more scandalous than just receiving. The shepherd pursues the one. Now here's what you have to understand, okay? Here's what you have to understand. Um, There are moments where God will actually give more attention to some over others. What? Yeah, no, he leaves the 99. And he gives his attention to the one. Now in that day and age, what would happen is the shepherd every night would count his sheep. And he would make sure that those who are his still remain his. I'm gonna say that again for those of you who missed it. The shepherd counts every day to make sure that those who are his remain his. And when one wanders off, the shepherd pursues. The shepherd pursues. Why? Because the one needs the shepherd more than the 99. The one needs the shepherd more than the 99. What happens after this? He finds the sheep He puts it on his shoulder and he journeys back home. Now watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. He doesn't find the sheep and go, oh man, you look like you're doing great. You look like you're doing fine. Uh, Let's just set you up with a nice bachelor pad and you can just enjoy life without me. Right? He doesn't do that. No, he says, no, you need me. The shepherd, the sheep, needs the shepherd. The reason the shepherd pursues the sheep is because the shepherd is aware that without the shepherd, the sheep has no way of surviving. And so similarly, I would argue, why does God pursue you? Why did God go to the extreme lengths of sending his son to die on the cross on your behalf because you don't have it in yourself? To save you. To save you. And so he carries, he carries the sheep. Here's also what doesn't happen, okay? The sheep doesn't look at the shepherd and go, hey, shepherd, man, thanks so much for finding me, but I'm good. Like, I'll take it from here. No, the shepherd carries the sheep. The journey of the sheep going back home is a journey of being carried. It is a journey of being carried. What was Jesus doing on the cross? As he hung there naked for six hours, dying between two criminals, a criminal's death that he did not deserve. As he carried your sin, as he carried your judgment, as he absorbed in his body all the wrath of God, he was carrying you home. He was carrying you back home to the Father. Where is God today? He's willing to carry you home. He's he's willing to carry you home. Do you know why there is so much power in the blood of Jesus? There's so much power in the blood of Jesus because it is the blood of Jesus that redeems us so that we can go back home. And so we're gonna sing that we've been washed in the blood. We've been washed in the blood. We've been washed in the blood. When Moses sets up the scene with with the Israelites in Exodus and he is commanded by God to sacrifice a lamb 
and to use the blood of the lamb to paint the doorpost so that when the angel of the when the angel of death comes the angel of death will pass over the way in which the door frames were set up in that day and age as they would have been painted with blood okay i want you to catch this it would have been the hebrew letter that represented the word life Life was literally painted in blood over the homes of the Israelites. And so as the angel of death showed up, he saw the homes that God had marked with his life. And where God has marked his life by the power of his blood, death has nothing else to do but pass over. Death cannot enter. Death cannot curse. Death cannot redeem. Death has to pass over. That's the power of the blood. That's the power of the blood. So I'm going to invite the worship team up as we sing. I've been washed. I've been washed.
Through his blood I have the mission And now I stand forgiven I'm justified, sanctified I once was dead but now I'm alive And when he comes I'll see his face God how good is that how good is that we are just so thankful to what the Lord has done we're going to worship some more and we're going to have some more of the word of God but for a moment I want to share some other thoughts about what happened on a day like this day I always tell you every single time we celebrate these events that the Bible talks about, I want to remind you there was a day like this day that what started as the great entry on Palm Sunday, two days later because of threats and insecurities, the plotting would begin. The plotting would begin on how to capture him, how to crucify him. And, and by the way, you know, the, the Bible tells us that there there were times before where they really tried to take him by force or they would try to throw him off a cliff and, 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 and various things. And the Bible says that he would always escape from their clutches. He would, he would always just somehow get away, not because he, he fought his way out, but literally the Lord's protection was on him. And, and so we recognize that he couldn't be taken by force. He had to be given up. And in reality, what had to happen was it, it required an inside job. It required an inside job from one of his own disciples who sold him out. Sold him out. It's, it's not a coincidence that, of course, money is involved in this sellout. And there's a scripture that the team will put up here that you know that Judas sold Jesus. He, he conspired with the political system, the religious system, and, and he agreed to a price of 30 pieces of silver. And if you equate it, depending on, on, on which coin they used, you know, it was somewhere between 100 to 441 current dollars. In other words, 
Judas sold out his master for less than $500 or four months wages in his day. And by the way, at the end of it, he didn't want the money. He wanted to bring it back. Then they didn't want the money because they, they recognized that it was blood money, money that really sold a, an, innocent, an innocent life. And, and you know, many times as we, we think about Good Friday, we think about the, the death, the punishment that was on Christ. We, we think about the nails. We think about the, the crown of thorns, the whippings, the, the things that happened to his physical body. But, but rarely do we think about the soul. Rarely do we think about the heart of the Lord. What, what I want to call the silent killers. The silent killers. The, the killer of betrayal. The killer of money. The, the killer of a kiss that when he had to be identified, when they said to Judas, well, well show us who he is, who, which one is Jesus. The Bible says that he kissed him. And the Lord said to him, you betray your master with a kiss. You betray your master with money. You betray your master with a kiss. And, and we look at Judas, we go, oh, you know, Judas is a bad man. He's just a, just a bad dude. But, but you know, if we're honest, there's a little bit of Judas in all of us. We're all capable. We're all capable of selling out the Lord. We're all capable of, of doing things maybe for money or selling the Lord out for something as, as, as cheap as a kiss. Now, we know that really a, a kiss should be an intimate thing. Judas used it for betrayal because that's what the enemy does. The enemy corrupts the things that God desires to be pure and to be right. And makes him evil and wicked. It is almost like the enemy saying, you know, you desire worship from these people. You, you desire them to bring you gifts. But I'm going to have them sell you out literally for nothing. See, that's the heart of humanity. Humanity sells out the Lord of glory for nothing. God sends the greatest prize of heaven for you and for me. So I want to encourage us today. And I want us to continue to look at the love and the sacrifice of the Father because he loves us. And you're going to hear more about this as Pastor Moses comes up and then we share communion. Will you, will you pray with me right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, as we reflect today, as we contemplate, as we remember and we recall how great your love how great your sacrifice. Lord, we thank you that no amount of money, no kiss, no betrayal, no silent killer of the soul was able to derail you. We thank you that you went to the cross for us. We thank you that you rose on the third day. And we thank you that we honor you and worship you with all our substance and with all we are today. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Go ahead, service host. You can receive. There'll be, there'll be things uh, up behind me here on, on how you can give just before the worship team uh, comes up once again. And then Pastor Moses, we have communion. I just wanted to share a, a few things with you. First of all, it's so good to see you. How many, how many know it's good to be off today? Praise God. And, uh, you know, um, I, I know there's all this antichrist sentiment, but... Um, it is amazing to me how many things are actually closed today because they know they know there's a significant event that has happened on um, on this day and we are so thankful well uh, just quickly uh, we have merch I don't know if you've seen our merch uh, I don't know where our merch is as our merch just have people bought our merch we have a we have a hoodie and we have a t-shirt uh, that is uh, commemorating our, our sermon series, Yeshua HaMashiach. And, and so you can uh, pre-order this. It's great material. Uh, we got a new supplier, and so we're really excited uh, about our merch. Please, uh, you can purchase it, and it'll be in just in a, in a few weeks. We'll give you more details on that. And, and you know, a year ago, right about this season, we actually launched our third service. We've been going now for, uh, come on, give God praise for that, an entire, an entire year. Yeah. And so uh, coming up right after the Easter, the Easter time frame, we're going to be launching a, kind of a, a brand new 
a sermon, not sermon, I want to say a service, a service format, particularly to, not so much in the second service, but to um, assist the first and the third with some of the response songs and worship. And so we're going to be making some changes. There might not be a ton of changes in, in the second, but, but we'll see. But one of the things we also want to do is something called Social Sundays. And, and Social Sundays are going to be really about establishing commun community, really. You know, it is communion too, but really it's about community and fellowshipping and getting to know each other. And so on April the 14th, we're going to have, we're going to have Social Sundays. Sunday and, and after every service, so we're still going to have service, but after every service, we're going to have uh, what they call refreshments, right? Um, we're going to give you things like asparagus and broccoli and <laughs> probably not, right? Probably not, but uh, we're going to have some 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 goodies together. We're going to fellowship. We're going to have a great time. And so the first one is on is on April the 14th. Great time to invite people to the house of God. I had, a, had an amazing moment last week. Uh, a lady, maybe she's in the service right now. She came up to me. She said, Pastor, I'm one of those people that take off right after service. And, and I'm like, really, my dear? And so she introduced herself. I'll tell you, it just filled my heart. I was so blessed that, that she would do that. And so, uh, listen, you are important to us. We're, we're not just here to fill seats. You are you are important. You matter to us. We want to connect with you. And so this will give Pastor Moses and the other pastors a, an opportunity to meet, greet, fellowship, even do a little bit of time in ministry. So uh, mark your calendars, April the 14th, 14th, after every service, we will have social Sundays. Amen. So remember that Sunday is, uh, is coming up. We have three services on Easter Sunday. It's going to be a, a powerful time. If some of you would be so willing to come to the first or the third service, we would, we would give you a kiss for that, a good kiss, by the way. And uh, so we could ease the pressure a little bit. But uh, once again, we're so glad you're here. And so let's invite the worship team back up here and then Pastor Moses, and then we'll have communion. God bless you. Hallelujah. Father, we give you glory in this room. Come on, would you extend your hands with us? We honor you. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all.
his wounds. His wounds have paid my ransom. One more time, church. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds. His wounds have paid my ransom. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Praise God. Come on, how many are grateful? You know, when Jesus hung there on the cross and declared the words, it is finished. I want you to know that the term that he actually used wasn't a term that meant, I quit. That's not what he meant. It's not when you and I are faced with a difficult task and we can't figure it out and we go, hey, I'm finished with this. He actually used a term that they would stamp on official documents to declare a matter completely resolved it was not a statement of weakness it was a statement of power because only those who had the power could use the stamp to declare a matter resolved and so even on the cross what looks like a moment of defeat what looks like an individual just giving up. I want you to declare, I want you to see this, that even on the cross, Jesus has all power. And he declares the matter resolved. He declares the matter resolved. And so I want to talk to you in this segment just a little bit about what true love looks like. And if we could throw up my, my timer back there. Otherwise, I'm going to go too long. I want you to know that the story of the shepherd wouldn't, it wouldn't have shocked the audience that Jesus is talking to. It, it wouldn't have come as a complete surprise that there was a shepherd who lost a sheep and he went after the sheep and he came back rejoicing. In that day and age, sheep were incredibly valuable. They meant sources of income. And so, of course, we get the rejoicing shepherd. The audience of Jesus' day would have totally been able to relate with the rejoicing shepherd. Here's what they would not have understood. Why is all of heaven rejoicing? We get why the shepherd rejoices. But why is all of heaven rejoicing? And I want you to know that heaven only rejoices if God rejoices. And so heaven rejoicing is synonymous with God the Father rejoicing. See, that's the part that they would have tripped over about because that's the part that they would have had to have been forced to ask themselves the question, am I really of that much value to the Father? That's the point. The point is, you are. Why? And I can, I can orate an incredible, beautiful speech of why you might be of great value to the Father, but let me just put it as simple as this, because you are His. That's it. You are His. And that's why you are of great value to him. And here's the beautiful part. You might not be living like you're his, but you're still his. You might have separated from the shepherd, but you're still his. You might be here out of resentment, but you're still his. You might be here thinking, man, I'll just get this over with because my family invited me and so I don't want to look like the bad guy. Maybe that's why you're here. Out of courtesy, but I want you to know that you're still his. You're, you're still his. 
I want you to notice that what this story reveals to us about God is that God sees the overlooked. God sees the overlooked. Now, I, I, I talked very briefly about the fact that God gives more attention to the one over the 99. Let me explain why. Because you ever wonder, and even in life, people ask the question, man, where is God? Do you want to know where God is? God is with those who need him the most. That's where God is. The reason you might not see the activity of God in your life is because you have not come to the place where you need him. God is with those who need him the most. And sometimes you and I get frustrated because we think, we think, we think God is with those who are more spiritual than others. That's what we think. Hey, where's God? He's with the more spiritual people. And what we tell ourselves is this. Hey, the more spiritual I can get, the more of God's attention I will attract. And we are deeply offended when we don't get that attention. Pastor Tony and I just did a podcast on Kanye West. Remember, Kanye West had this huge uproar of Jesus is King, man. The gospel, everything was happening. Churches invited him in. There's a new podcast that came out with, with Kanye West talking to another host. And here's what Kanye West says. Hey, I've got a problem with Jesus because Jesus doesn't answer my prayers. Because someone lied to him. Someone told him the more spiritual activity exists in your life, the more you will attract the attention of God. And so if you're more spiritual, the more God will answer your prayers. That's a lie. For you, are, you and I are not sovereign, church. There is only one sovereign being, and he sits on the throne. He rules with heaven and the universe in his hand. All of creation is his. And so the Bible says that he gives his mercy to whom he wants to give his mercy to. He gives his grace to whom he wants to give his grace to. He gives his attention to whom he wants to give his attention to. And I'm here to argue that his attention is given to those who need him the most. So what if, what if, okay, lean in. What if being spiritual is always realizing your need for him? What if that's what it means to be spiritual? To always realize your need for Him. For God is my ever-present help. Ever-present. In times of need. <laughs> In times of need God is closest to those who need him the most God is closest to those who need I've been thinking I've been thinking a lot about time travel I really have um, I believe I believe time travel exists and now I know you're thinking Did I, I'm not listening to it. any any other word that comes out of this guy's mouth I believe it does I believe it does. Now watch this, how do I know it? Because God lives outside of time, but he works within time. Hello? He, he, he lives outside of time, but his activity is within time. Now here's the question I have, okay? Here's the, I'm just gonna invite you into my thinking for a moment. Hey, how fast is God? Like we know God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all places at all times. But think about it. God is outside of time, but he works within time. How fast is God? Do you know that the fastest thing that exists in our universe is the speed of light? It's the speed of light. Within the context of our universe, it, that's the fastest thing that exists in our universe is the speed of light, okay? And if you think about galaxies and stars and different universes that exist beyond ours, they say that there are some million light years, billion light years away. And all of that exists within the context of time. God lives outside of that. Okay? 
God is faster than the fastest thing in our universe. Like, he's outside of time, but he works within time. Now, here's the crazy part. Um, somebody here has a need for God. God is right there. Somebody here has a need for God. God is right there. How fast is God? As fast as you need him. God is near to the brokenhearted. Do you know what that word near means? It means to not be distant in time, space, or circumstance. Time, space, or circumstance. Do you know how close God is to you? He's so close. He is so close. And he's closest to those who need him. Here's what the gospel is not. The gospel is not God running an auction and giving his attention to the highest bidder. Did you hear what I just said? See, because we think, hey, Christianity is this membership club and those who pay the most get God's attention. I call foul on that. That's, that's not the gospel. The gospel isn't the highest bidder gets God attention. Here's who gets God, it's God's attention. Those who realize that they don't have the efforts to save themselves. That's who God displays his efforts toward. Here's, here's what else it means. It means God is ever approaching you. The word near, God is near to the broken heart, it literally means ever approaching. Like God is constantly walking toward you. Constantly walking toward you. Constantly walking toward you. You could be walking away from God, God is constantly walking toward you. He, he's, he's, he's pursuing you. He's, he's pursuing you and, and I want you to know that you're here because God pursued you. I'm here because God pursued me. And, and I'm, still, I'm here because God is still pursuing me. See, God does not stop pursuing at the cross. God is still pursuing. See, here's what happens. You and I, when we enter the 99 club, here's what we think. We think we've earned God's attention. What, what do you mean God doesn't answer my prayers? I'm in the 99 club. I didn't forsake him. I served when others wouldn't. I gave my efforts when others wouldn't. I put in time. I put in sweat. I did what others did not have the ability to do. What do you mean I don't have God's attention? I earned it. I'm in the 99 club. And yet when we're the one, when we're lost, we, we jump to the other extreme where we go, I don't deserve God's attention. I don't deserve that he pursue me. I don't deserve that he come after me. And yet he does. Why? Because our value or lack of value is not in where we are or who we are. Our value is simply in the fact that the shepherd thought we were worth pursuing. That's where our value comes from. The shepherd thought we were worth pursuing pursuing. You know what motivated the shepherd to go after the one? Not anger. See, you think the reason God is heading your, your way and he's always approaching you is because he's angry. No, no, no. Anger is not the motivation. You know what it is? Love. For the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his Son. So what, what is motivating the Father to send His Son is not hatred, is not anger, is not judgment. It is love. It's love. So what does love, what does love look like? You can get rid of this, Joseph. What does love, what does love look like? I've been really thinking about this a lot to the point where I'm kind of losing I'm kind of losing sleep over this. What is love? We know that God is love. So I began searching the scriptures. I began searching the old scriptures. I began searching the New Testament scriptures. I began looking at, I began looking at what love is, how God expresses love toward 
us. And the kind of love that God actually calls us to express toward others. Are you ready for this? Would you like to know what love is? Okay. Um, love only exists, true love only exists where time and energy is spent. Love will always deplete you of time and energy. Now, we don't like that kind of love. We like loving from far. You know what I mean? We, we like the convenient love. We like, we like the love that's like, you ever do this with your family? Hey, since you're up anyways, can you just grab this for me? You know what I mean? Convenient love. Hey, since you're already up. But that's not, that's not what true love is. True love requires time and energy to be spent. For the love that the Bible uses to describe even the love that God had shed toward us is agape love. It's sacrificial love. In other words, it requires time and energy to be spent. Have you ever wondered why God didn't send Jesus as a fully grown man to just fall from the sky like Thor and go, here I am, humanity. You know what, you know what I mean? Thunder and light. Here I am, humanity. I will now die for you. No, no, no. He, he subjected himself to the lostness of humanity. He, he came in the lowest form that he possibly could. He lived for 33 years here on earth. What did he do? He put in time and energy. He put in time and energy. So when the Bible says that we don't have a high priest who cannot relate with us, why don't we have a high priest who cannot relate, who can relate with us? Because our high priest has put in time and energy. Do you think it was easy for Jesus to carry a cross? To subject himself to the kind of torture, the shame, the humiliation? No, no, no. He put in time and energy. So when you say you love someone, the question is, are you putting in time and energy? Oh yeah, I love you. But where's the time and energy? You know why we're doing Social Sunday? We're giving you an opportunity to spend time and energy in the community you call church. So, so you say you love your church. Well, have you put in time and energy? Have you? You say you love your God. Well, does he have your time and energy? Or, or do those words fall in this black hole? Because there's no time or energy that they can be attached to. So I began thinking, true love is time and energy. Time and energy. Time and energy. And I... I began to go into the science of it. You ready for this? Scientifically, in order to change a mass, you need time and energy. Without time and energy, mass actually will not be affected. It will not be changed. It will remain the way it was. Mass, in order for it to change, requires time and energy this is why God sent his son and put in time and energy because if he had not it would not have affected the condition of our human heart and the mass that exists within us that we call our soul would have been left unchanged That's how good God is. That's how good God is. And so what does the cross show us? That we should never question whether the Father loves us. Because the cross is the ultimate demonstration of God putting in time and energy toward humanity. Can I give you one last thing? Do you know that my relationship with God does not consist of just me giving him my time. 
my relationship with God actually consists of him giving me his time. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, yeah. And, and you will never understand this if you don't understand the love of the Father. Because if you always think your relationship with God is you giving him your time, your relationship with God is gonna be lopsided. But if you understand that your relationship with God also consists of God giving you his time, it's only in the context of him giving you his time that you understand that he actually loves you. Because if you don't understand that, then your relationship with God simply exists on the basis that you love him. And maybe that's why some of you are unsure. Does God love me? Because you think this relationship will only survive if you continue to give him your time. I'm here to tell you God is here to give you his time. His time and his energy. Would you bow your head? Just every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm just going to pray for you. Father, I thank you for this moment. You are so present. You are here. You know, moments like this, I always want to give an opportunity to those who might be in the room or watching online. And you feel today's the decision that you need to put your faith in Jesus. That you need to receive the one who has put in the time and energy to show you his love for you. For the reason this Friday is called Good Friday is not just because of what happened on the cross, it's because of what can happen now because of the cross. That you can actually know your God and know your creator. There is a God, church, and he wants to give you your, his time and his energy so that you would know he loves you. And just as every head is bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, I just want to give you a simple prayer to pray. Do you and God have more to talk about? Absolutely, but this is where it starts. If that's you, would you just say to him, Jesus, come into my life. If that's you, in this room or online, you know this is the moment you cross the line of faith. Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my life. I see your love for me and I give you my life. I wanna pray for you if you said that prayer. Would you just raise up your hand just as every head is bowed and eyes closed. If you said that prayer, this is a moment between you and God. I see your hand. I see your hand. Yeah. That's it. This is a moment between you and God. I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you for these hands in the room and online. More importantly, I thank you for these hearts that have now welcomed you in as their Lord and as their Savior, who have received your love the time and the energy you put to demonstrate how much you love them. Fill them now, Lord, with joy. Fill them now with your spirit and let them be changed forevermore. And for the rest of us, God, we thank you that you see us, you chose us, and you redeemed us. And for that, we want to give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, can we thank God for all those who said yes? I'm going to invite you to stand as the worship team comes back up to lead us in a moment of worship, and then we're going to have communion. praises to our God, from whom all blessings flow. He alone is the King 
and we honor his matchless name, who is like our God, not to be compared. So come on, extend your hands and just begin to worship. Put a praise on your lips with me. Come on. Thank you, God. we're going to receive communion we're going to do this a little bit a little bit different the elders are coming to the front they're going to be serving you everybody can everybody point this way everybody point this way point this way so here's what I want you to do you're going to come out of your seats in that direction you're going to come out of your seats in that direction you're going to come to the couple or the team that is standing in front of your section so everybody's going to exit that way and then you're going to return from the opposite way so that uh, we don't have chaos. If there are those that cannot come to the front, please come and receive uh, the emblems for them. And then we'll do this in the order of our rows. So the first rows will we'll exit this way, come and get their emblems, and then come back to your seats the opposite way. And then we will partake together. So can we do that? As uh, Kimberly leads us in this song, let's come and receive the emblems. Hallelujah, 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 
Can you help me sing? Hallelujah. Come on, Levites, lift up your voice and say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We will sing to the Father. Lift up your voice and say, Hallelujah! Oh, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! To our matchless God, we say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Come on, let's lift that up to the Father, say. it up and say, Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. We come together collectively and we say, Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. saturated that really we forget we forget to really understand that this is the gospel you see it in stadiums and sports events and 
You know, it's really used for salvation messages, but this is the gospel that God so loved the world. That Father, that Father so loved the world that what did he do? He, he gave. Not he sold out, he gave. He gave his only son because that was the only answer. As a matter of fact, you know that, that there was a survey done in heaven and the survey indicated that nobody was worthy. And there were tears in heaven because of that, but the Lamb of God was revealed. He was the only one. Think about all the amazing people and creatures up there and he was the only one worthy. Only one. He gave. The Father gave because of love. Love sent. Love sent. Jesus came because of his love for the Father. The Father's love for you today. That's what causes us to be found. I would speak to you on Sunday about we have found the Father. We have found the Father. And, and I want you to notice in the Scripture... What is the only thing that is required of you? What is the only thing that is required of you? Faith. Faith. Just believe. Just believe that whosoever, if anyone, if anyone will believe, you will have eternal life. You will have everlasting life. All you have to do is believe. The Bible says believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. So as we receive, communion today I want you to understand to the best of our ability because we probably will never fully understand but to the best of our ability the love of the Father let's partake of the bread which represents the broken body hallelujah and the cup which represents the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. Come on, church, just lift up your hands to the Lord right now. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. We love you. Lord, we praise you and we love you. Lord, we love you, Lord. We love you, we love you. Mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Lord, we Hallelujah. We bless you. We bless your people. We bless your people. Lord, we praise you. Hallelujah. Yes. Lord, we praise you. So APC family. We're so glad that you joined us for our service and I hope that your life was impacted and that you felt God's presence. We're always accessible to you. If you ever have any questions, please email us at info at allpeopleschurch.ca. We would love to hear from you.